This program raises questions. This program is for people who find it hard to trust God. The best answers are wrapped in flesh and blood. My friends, people who are enduring real tragedies every single day. Quadriplegia, muscular dystrophy, stroke, bankruptcy, loneliness, singleness. We're gonna to talk to those very people who have touched my life. I remember when I was 12 years old, I remember working one day in the field. It was so hot. Uh, and southern summers are really hot with, with uh, humidity. And, and uh, I remember looking out over the field, and, and you actually could see the waves of heat across the top of the, the, the cotton. And I remember working that day, and I, I remember looking at that. And I looked at my family, and I looked at my friends, and I looked at the people in my community, and I actually, for a moment, panicked in my heart thinking, does that mean that this is my future? Is this where I'll, is this how I'll end up uh, as an adult, as a, as a man? The longer I have been in this wheelchair, the more I see that life, a happy life, a, a life of peace, purpose, that kind of life all boils down to choices. It's all about what you choose. It comes smack dab up against an irate neighbor or a neglectful spouse or a dead end job or even poverty, prejudice. You're faced with that, the toughest of circumstances, and what do you do? What do you choose? Well, the Bible says in Deuteronomy, choose life that you might live. But what does it look like? I mean, how do you choose that in the face of bigotry or hatred? How do you move beyond darkness into the breathtaking freedom of hope and help and happiness? Well, sometimes we need to see the answer to that question in living color. I was born on a place in Texas, and my dad was a sharecropper, and, and uh, we made a living by, by working the land. Yes, we had running water, me running to get it. Uh, we did not have running water. We didn't have uh, no restroom facilities, and, and uh, it was, uh, it was, that was life. From uh, the time a, a kid is born, a black kid is born in the South, you knew where you lived. You knew what the deal was. And I remember waiting with my mom and my sisters in the front of our home for the truck that would come by and pick us up to take us to the field for work during the day. And I remember the sound of that, uh, that, that old pickup truck turning the corner and coming down our little dirt road to pick us all up. It had benches on the back, it was open, and we sat, we piled into that little truck and, and uh, went from house to house. It was hard work. It was backbreaking work, working in the fields. It was, it was hard. The cotton went to the owners of the property. We would essentially make the equivalent of about $2 a day uh, for an eight-hour day. My mother wistfully looked off into the horizon. She just wanted to get it done, just get it over with so she could get back home. I started at 14 working in restaurants. I actually got a raise. I went from $2 a day to $3 a day when I uh, took my job in the restaurant. They paid us in cash. They'd throw the change on the floor for you. Yeah, you could, you could pick it up if you wanted to. And, I was a kid. I was trying to make a living. I picked it up. Yeah. Having coins thrown on the floor for you was just another way to remind you of your place so that you would not forget your place. Growing up in the South and being uh, being a black kid, you learn not to 
you learn not to make eye contact with white people. Making eye contact could be considered uh, 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 aggressive for an African-American person. So uh, they would, uh, they would t if they tossed you a uh, change, you, you picked it up and uh, uh, you, went about your, you went about your business. You couldn't drink water from a, from a fountain that did not have a label colored on it. Uh, you literally, that would get you in trouble. That could get you in serious trouble. I mean, that could get you hurt. We went to the movie theaters, but we could only be in the balcony. During the 60s and the civil rights movement came to our little hometown. And uh, me and two other of my friends, we were going to make our own mark on the on the movement. And we went to uh, some of the local diners and and uh, 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 and asked to be seated and to be served. And of course, uh, we knew we weren't going to get served. The uh, local police department showed up and, and took me uh, into a room in, in the back, in the storeroom. And he used the N-word and asked me if, if I was a good nigger. And that's when I began to be frightened. Because in a moment, when that word is, is said, your life could change in a moment. They have power over your life. They had power over my life and he put the gun to my head that's when he asked me and I thought I was a dead kid and I said yes he could have been simply playing with me I don't know I said yes I am I will be he holstered his weapon and told me that I better not ever do that again and they left It has an effect on, on how you perceive your future. It has an effect on how you perceive your present. I remember a white counselor telling me, uh, you shouldn't bother about college. You should uh, think of, uh, of uh, maybe taking a job as uh, then as, a, as an assistant in a garage or, or um, maybe uh, if you're fortunate, uh, maybe uh, you might be fortunate enough to get a job in the, uh, in the postal system, but don't think about, don't think about college, youth engineering or, or a profession. Uh, there's no place for you. 1964, I came to California and got a job working at a plant in uh, McDonnell Douglas plant in Santa Monica. And that started my engineering career for me. And it just, for me, was a dream come true. In 1990, I was sitting in my office at the aerospace plant in Burbank. A good life, good pay. Looking out the window one day and I, I felt God say, you're all done. And I thought, what do you mean I'm all done? I, I fought hard to get here, studied hard, worked hard. No, you're all done. And within months, the pastor of the church asked me on a missions trip if I would leave my work as an engineer, if I would come on staff to help him pastor the church and to serve the congregation. And I, saying yes to that began the journey that brought me to Johnny and Friends. At Johnny and Friends, I serve as the vice president and the chief financial officer at Johnny and Friends. Well, my background uh, came from a big corporate background, uh, pretty high up on the corporate chart, chief operating officer of a billion and a half dollar company, a NASDAQ company after that. But when I was being interviewed for uh, the job here at Johnny and Friends, it was quite a life change uh, for me and my family. I'd never been in ministry before. And so uh, I met Billy Burnett that day during, during the interview. In fact, he was interviewing me. I walked into Billy's office and uh, we locked eyes. 
and he gave me a, a Billy Burnett smile that looks like a smile from someone you've known for 20 years. He shook my hand with both hands and pulled me toward him. And I knew right away that all of the barriers that I had set up in my corporate experience were broken down. Uh, he was either a great pro in interviewing uh, or he was the genuine article. And I can tell you, Billy Burnett is the genuine article. All right, then uh, let's get started this morning. Um, let's go ahead and go around the table. Steve, tell us what's, uh, what's happening in the world of uh, communications, radio. Chip and I had a great meeting with uh, the, the Healing Channel out of Cairo, and they're going to do a translation of our half-hour uh, weekly program and air it there throughout the Middle East. We'll go to 16 countries, 270 million people will hear it. So it will be translated in Arabic, and then I'm working with Sat7 to do a translation in Farsi. Most of the staff call me Pastor Billy because I serve as a, as a volunteer pastor, almost full time, but I serve as a pastor. And there are two parts in me that I say are always in dynamic tension. There's the engineer part of me that wants everything to be ordered correctly, fully paid for, on budget, on time, and then there's the Pastor Billy in me that knows that you will never have everything you need at every time you need it and in the amounts you need without faith. That's right. Thank you. Billy! Oh, hi, Jenny. Hey, hey. I'm so glad you came in. Thanks. I hope you weren't busy. I buzzed ya. Anyway, I'm writing radio programs, and uh, thanks, Francie. Thank you. Need to drink my water. I'm writing a radio program, Wheels for the World, and I'm trying to recruit more physical therapists to join us. I can't remember that wonderful story. You were in Ghana, West Africa, and you look out the window. Yeah, Je we, it was a quiet moment. We'd finished the interviews, and I sat back, looked out of the window, and in the corner of my eye, I saw this Ghanaian lady coming around the corner, around the building, and she had this bandana on her head, mm an apron and a long skirt all the way down to the ground had a rubbing board in her wash tub and she was getting ready to do the laundry and i i looked at her yeah and i was transported back to being on the back porch of our home with my mother mama teal everybody called her mama teal she wore a bandana an apron she'd be washing our clothes in that same tub that same rubbing board Oh, my goodness, Johnny was so poignant. It must have been tears, huh? It did. It moved me to tears, Johnny. Yeah, yeah. It did. Well, you know, a life-transforming moment like that, that that's what I'm trying to get in this radio program, because we need more physical therapists to be signing up for Wheels for the World. Was it 16 Wheels? No, it's 18, Johnny. 18. 18. 18 Wheels 18 for the World 18 Wheels trips. for the World trips. Over 8,000 chairs. Whoa. And Bibles. And Bibles. That's true, but, you know, we could do 20. Oh, we could be doing 21. I've been praying about Thailand. I've been praying about Cameroon. I've been praying about Brazil. There's 21. Yeah, we need prayer. We need what? Uh, we need support. Support, yes, finances, we do. all that stuff. Yes, we do. I, I know that you guys pray um, in accounting every, what is it? Oh, Perry and I, every Friday. He's the director of finance. Would you add he it to the list? Yes, we'll do it. It's already done. Are you serious? I'm serious. Consider it done. Good. Okay, i got to get back to work. Thank you so here. much. Grateful. Okay. Very, very good info to put on the radio program. <laughs> Thank you so much. So much. Thank you. Love you get one too. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Love you. This, is, know this is home. That's right. This is home. What are you going to have today? What am I having today? Oh, it must be something. Should our we... typical, very healthy deli food. I let's see. Uh, oh, let's see. This is Friday. Uh, we should be uh, clam chowder. No, I, I, I no more clam chowder for me. And he came in here one day, and it was like a dream come true. The man is. The man has a heart of gold. There is no mean bone in his body. There's nothing he would do for anybody ever. He's just a neat, a unique individual. He's truly an angel here sent from above to guard and protect a lot of people. 
<laughs> See, I told you, I can't say things about him without crying because he's so unique. And now you've got me crying. <laughs> but there's nobody that has ever met him that doesn't instantly fall in love with him and can sense his goodness. So he's just, I'm blessed. Billy has the ability to be sitting uh, behind his desk as the CFO and analyzing uh, 10 years of financial data uh, and turning around and uh, spiritually counseling somebody who comes through the door that needs his attention at that time. Uh, and it's not something that he has to turn on. It is just part of his physical and spiritual being. It's part of his, his trust in God. It's part of who has taken him on that trip uh, from where he began in Texarkana to where he is today. I was down here yesterday and I went into a donut shop on the way home to get a Ooh, cup of donut, coffee. Donut. Of course, Billy being who he is, uh, he takes great interest uh, in my personal life as well as a friend. Uh, we have cried together, we've laughed together, uh, and he is, uh, he is one of those extraordinary people that you meet in life. We, are. we have arrived. We made it down to Ryan's house. Well, let's go check on him. Are you able to get out of the, over yes, there? Yes, I am. I think so. Okay. My son Ryan has uh, spent 27 years with a severe developmental disability. Uh, he is blind. He's in a lot of pain. Uh, his disabilities uh, mean he can't sit up in a wheelchair without a brace. He doesn't speak. And I've had a lot of people that have uh, prayed with me and had true empathy uh, for my situation and for Ryan's. Uh, but not many people show up. Yeah, my goodness. He's not feeling good, Billy. He's not doing well, is yeah. he? Yeah. Let's just would you, let's, would you pray for him? Yeah, today? let's just pray. Let, let me just put my hands on him. Let me just touch his body. Oh my goodness. Well, Father, you uh we're glad that we have you, Lord. And Ryan uh, right now his body is obviously uh racked with some some pain and discomfort. But you're his you're his God. You're his Father. You, you're his Creator. And I pray now, Father, would you, would you bring comfort to Ryan? Would you give him, would you give him a sense of well-being in his body? Not many people uh, show up and pray with Ryan and lay hands on him and, and have cried with me and laughed with me. Uh, and Billy Burnett is that person. And it comes from deep within. It comes from uh, exactly who he is as a human being and as a man uh, who loves his Lord. Amen. Well, Billy is much more than a CFO. He's really our CSO. He's our chief spiritual officer. And everything that he does is passed through that. I think God looks at Inglewood and he says, oh, Inglewood, if you only knew what you can be. Inglewood, if you only knew. Uh, and Inglewood, if you seek my face, if you search, if you search the things of God, Inglewood, you'll discover what you can be. That's good. <laughs> I had heard you weren't doing well. <laughs> I in the hospital. What can I say? You spent Christmas in the hospital? I did. I had you pneumonia. Were, oh, Doug had pneumonia. My boss had pneumonia, too. You had pneumonia, I've huh? I've never had it before. The biggest joy in being down here actually is, is, the, is being able to serve a congregation where I see immediate, immediate feedback in terms of my pastoral passion and calling. I'm getting, I'm getting feedback in terms of my effort. 
I don't, I'm not having to wait and wonder, is it making a difference? And, I, and I'm like a father and a grandfather to just about everyone at the church here. Uh, it means so very much to me that, that I can play a role in their lives where there are no grandfathers or there are no fathers in their lives. And I get to be that role model for them. Pastor Billy becomes that father for them. So I embrace them. I find out how they're, how they're doing. How are you doing in school? How, how are your classes going? Uh, that is also another role for me as well as a pastor. one time in my life. Some of you were messed up in your life. I was on meds. I was totally um, disoriented. Uh, my self-esteem was in the dirt. And I had burnt down my bridges with my family. And then um, the, the same church that I go to now picked, picked me up in a van one Sunday. And um, Pastor Billy was there. What can I say? Pastor Billy was there. And I just started seeing life from a totally different perspective. And those people at that church partnered with me until, and loved me until I could love myself. This woman is in a PhD, you're in a PhD I know. program. You know what? I'm getting close to my dissertation. Are you? Yes, I am. I'm what helped me now. and still helps me to this day, my father told me, uh, his faith said that life, life should be shaped by your beliefs in Christ, not by your circumstance. Hello? Hey, Pastor, how are you? <laughs> what are you laughing at? We have two houses that we operate out of the church, a, man, a man's house and a women's house and all of those clients, and we're going to go see the men now. There. Yeah. No. <laughs> Now you're happy, huh? Yeah. So we have Pastor Billy, and I fall kind of under Pastor Billy in the in the in the dwelling place structure. And um, one of the things that you learn when you're in the kind of field that I'm in, that you, it, it's, it's called like a giving. It, it really is a giving and a serving field. There's not much tangible that you get out of this field, and you give so much that after a while you become depleted. Okay. You want to go to the bank? Yes. You want to? Can you walk? Oh, you're not going to go with me? <laughs> and you have to have somebody that's over you, that's covering you, that's praying for you, that's rooting for you, that's pulling for you, and that's speaking into your life. Because I get a pat on the back from Pastor Billy, and I get a, I love you, and you're doing a great job, and let me tell you what God told me to tell you. And that's the stuff that, that's the stuff that makes it happen. You know, those, I mean, those are the little things that keep you, okay, he can't come over here and visit with my men every day, but I can. And he can pump me up on Sunday, or he can call me sometime during the week, or he might write me an email, I love you, Sister Candace, you're doing a great job. Can't ask for nothing better than that, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's it. I believe that the circumstances of our life is to help other lives be better lives and to teach from what I've learned. It's great for us to be together, though, isn't it? To share the love of Jesus Christ among ourselves and for the work that Jesus has called us to do, to be bright lights for Jesus Christ in this world. That's awesome, isn't it? Can we just bow our heads together now and, and uh, pray for our meal and our time together? Lord Jesus, we're just grateful that we can be together today as a staff who serve you and who serve families and people affected by disabilities and one of the places where billy makes a difference here at johnny and friends is that uh, we use uh, human beings in ministry just like every place else that employs people uses human beings uh, and uh, the people have the same foibles and they have uh, the same issues and uh, th those those issues are the same but there is something that is not the same about working here at johnny and friends and that is how we resolve those issues and that is because if there is an issue between two people, eventually they're going to run into Billy Burnett. He is a born reconciler. He's a reconciler among the races. He's a reconciler among two people. Uh, he is one that uh, does it without thinking. He just by his presence and his love and his love of Christ, uh, he reconciles people to him just as, re as Christ reconciled himself to all of us.
Amen. 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 God from All blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Wow, Bill. Incredible. What a story. Yeah. You know, standing there and watching a dining patron mm. throw your tip on the floor and expecting you to bend down and pick it up. Oh, my goodness. Or, or, or somebody's got a gun to your head and it's loaded and he's telling you that the next time you step out of line, he's going to pull the trigger. Mm. <laughs> Friend, how in the world does one go from that kind of fear, that kind of intimidation and hatred and bigotry? I mean, how do you move beyond that to turning around and actually ministering and, and forgiving and loving those very people, caring about them, breaking that cycle of, of prejudice and showcasing genuine love and reconciliation? Billy, I tell you, it, 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 it has to require an intersection with Jesus Christ, right? That's right. We live in an imperfect world with imperfect people, mm. and the way you reconcile that is through Jesus Christ. Mm. And when you choose to follow Jesus, you can't help but make a change. A change that begins in your own heart, in the lives of others, and a change in your community. And sometimes in a change in a whole nation. That's right. Mm. Well, Billy, when I see that you died to uh, mm. resentment, self-pity, hatred, bitterness, yeah. retaliation, I tell you, it tells me that you were able to die to the very things that Jesus Christ died for. And like him, I mean, you, you face the darkness and you've decided to forgive and, and showcase to those who hurt you uh, love and help and hope instead of uh, bitterness and despair. That's what Christian service is all about. That's right. That's what we do here at Johnny and Friends. Oh, that's right. And Billy, I, 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 I know you know all about service because you just don't sit behind the desk you know, as executive vice president of the finance and administration here at the ministry. No, you, you, you get out of the office and you head off to Ghana on a Wheels of the World trip. And I've seen you serve as camp pastor at our family retreats for disabled people. Oh, I love being camp pastor. Do you? I get to break the word of, open up the word of God to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I just love it, Johnny. Well, Billy, I know there are a lot of folks who are looking in right now who are looking for a way to serve, just as uh, you have served. Got any ideas for them, Billy? Well, I sure do. We need people to pray for us, number one. We need volunteers. Mm. And we need your support. Yes. We need you to support the great work we're doing here at Johnny and Friends. And I want to ask you to join us in this global movement to minister the love of Christ to people who are still trapped in darkness.